Marriage changes every area of your life. Yes. And, you know, I talked about it earlier on one of my calls, but it's like, in a lot of cases, marriage is like a life or death decision in the sense of if you choose to settle for a marriage that doesn't reflect God, then you're going to be settling for the rest of your life you choose to say. That means you're neglecting yourself, rejecting yourself, Talk not prioritizing yourself, mm. creating insecurities, creating lack of value, creating low self-esteem. And you're, you're experiencing and living your life of dis-ease, which is going to create disease in your body. Mm. And now you attacking you because of the situation that you chose to be in that you knew wasn't in alignment with the excellence that God ordained for you. Yeah. I made vows. I broke them. Hindsight, I didn't comprehend the gravity of the exchange of this solemn promise, a vow, before God and man. It's time to unpack these sacred words so that I never take this oath lightly, ever again. I'm Latera Sar Whitfield, and this is the Marriage Vow series on the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. Welcome to the Dear Future Wifey Podcast. I'm your host, Latarius R. Winfield. Hey, listen, are you still shacking up with us? Come on, y'all. Let's make a commitment. Hit that subscription button and subscribe. Go ahead and turn on your notification bell so you'll be notified about our upcoming episodes. Listen, I'm so excited about the Marriage Vow Series. God has been doing an amazing work. I've been getting tons of emails and inbox messages and DMs about how transformative these episodes have been in your life. So listen, I totally take it as an honor. You know what? I am so happy to have today's guest on the podcast, man. I look at a lot of their videos. I just love what they're doing as a couple. They're purpose partners. Y'all hear me talk about that a lot. I said, I don't want a wife. I want a purpose partner, somebody that walks alongside of me and we do God's purpose together. And this couple exudes exactly that. So without further ado, welcome to the Dear Future Wifey podcast. My new homies, Ashley and Keratin Brown. How y'all doing? Doing awesome, great. Man, how about yourself? Man, I'm, I'm excited to talk to y'all. <laughs> I, I, I know y'all see them in their little matching outfits and all that type of stuff. <laughs> I know this wasn't by accident. Y'all, y'all wouldn't have had this custom made, huh? See, what well, we had, we was, had. Uh -huh. What happened was what, Karen? Go ahead. What had happened was I woke up and got dressed, <laughs> and I came out the office after a call with a client, and she had on the same thing. Uh, so we, but, we had, it but why we're matching is we had a family photo shoot, so yeah. the kids had. Oh, some everybody matching. had that. Everybody, everybody, yeah. Yeah, that's cute. That's nice. Can't wait to see those photos. And that's what's so great about y'all is y'all make marriage and family look fun. Mm. Y'all make it look fun. Uh, I know every day isn't sunshine and, and roses and butterflies. I know that y'all have y'all's uh, issues. And Carrington told me that y'all got married at a very young age. And as we go deeper into the Marriage Vow series, today's episode is entitled To Love, Cherish, and Obey. See, they've omitted the word obey out of the marriage vows because a lot of people didn't quite like that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people of the female persuasion didn't quite like that, <laughs> that, that, that word obey. And so we're going to unpack that. So um, y'all got married at what age? So I was 25. And I was 22. Mm-hmm. Look at yeah. you. 22 got my older woman. Yeah. yeah. Uh, robbed the cradle. <laughs> he robbed the cradle. So was it, did he have to prove himself a lot? Because he told me that when he met you, you were a boss lady. Like you had your stuff going on. You had your own house. You had your own stuff. You had your career going. Um, and here you are dating a younger guy. What, did you have any apprehension towards that? Yeah. So when we met, he was 21 at the time. I was 24. And looking back, I mean, it's a compliment that he said I was, I had it going on. I mean, I was, mm -hmm. I was working, I had a good job. I was getting my master's degree. And at the time, at that time in my life, I was open to whoever God had for me. So Carrington caught me at the right time, because if it would have been a year prior, I would have never even considered dating someone <laughs> younger than me. But he caught me at the right time because I was in a season where I was learning that who God has for you may not necessarily look or come in the package that you expect. Talk about so it. So he didn't have to prove anything. So I remember Cause first off we met on Instagram. So shout okay. out to the Instagram Come algorithm there it is, there for, it is now. for yeah. aligning y'all together. Al aligning <laughs> us and making that shake. But when he, when we first started talking, I saw him on social media 
and then I looked him up on Facebook because you know mm -hmm. that's where Facebook you get. Facebook tell all your background. Exactly. Yeah. Who you connected to, and I saw we had mutual friends. But then when I saw the year he was born, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I instantly was like, oh, never mind. But yeah. then something told me, Ashley, just give it a chance. And so once I made up my mind that I wasn't going to continue to, you know, make his age a big deal. Yes. He didn't have nothing to prove. So how long did it take you to, well, let me ask you this, Carrington. How long did y'all date or get to know each other before you knew, hold, hold on, God, this is the one that I believe you have for me. So I proposed after eight months, if I'm not mistaken. So we started dating officially August 1st, 2013. I proposed March 28th. Day before my birthday. Yeah, so I proposed <laughs> March 28th of the same year that we got married. Uh, August 1st, the next year. And so we dated for, what, eight months? Mm -hmm. Then we're engaged and we're married after a year and one day. And we've been married going on eight years. Yeah. And so that was the wow. journey of that. But when you talk about understanding and being like, hey, like, this is the one. Yeah. And that happened after about probably, what was that, three or four months maybe. Um, and it was a situation. I love telling stories. I think yeah, Ashley, I want to hear. Like, sometimes Ashley, I feel like she'd be like, "Don't tell that story." But, <laughs> no, no, I mean, no. you so, just, so, yeah, for sure, I'm it. telling it. So, so <laughs> what happened was, so one of the mistakes that Ashley and I did make, that I mean that we made uh, when we first started dating was we didn't implement standards and expectations all around, Good. and so we didn't have the conversation about the value and necessity of sexual abstinence. So one day we were at our apartment. I. I I ain't gonna say we slipped up, but we had. Yeah. There wasn't no slip. Like, yeah, it was intentional. We do. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, acts of purpose. Um, <laughs> acts of purpose. <laughs> exactly. It was an accident on purpose. At the same. Anyway, um, so that happened. And then following that situation, Ashley came out and she said, Carrington, you gotta go. And I, in my mind, I'm like, well, wait a minute. Like, we both should be in trouble. We both did this. And she was like, hey, you gotta go. She said, Carrington, I really like you. But my relationship with God is more valuable and more important to me than my relationship with you. Ooh. So if you can't be the man of God that I need you to be, then we won't be. Being the man that I am, I respected it, left, went to the bottom of her stairs and cried, right? Yeah. So cried, prayed. The next day I was at Chipotle in my feelings, man. And my, um, my high school counselor came in and I told her about the situation. Don't know why, but we just started talking about it. Then after that conversation, um, I received a text from Ashley, and it was a forwarded message from a friend of hers, and it said, hey, Ashley, um, God told me to tell you that the devil is going to attack your relationship in the area of sex intimacy because he doesn't want your mission and your ministry to come to fruition, to flourish. Mm. And so after I read that, all I heard was, hold on, this is your wife. Mm. And so I said, okay, good, I'm good, let's rock. <laughs> I said, I'm good. Let's go. <laughs> and so when you called up, then what did you say? You just apologized to her? To, and I apologized. And I was like, hey, we got to, we, if we want to do this thing, because we both desire to do it right, yeah. we're going to have to implement standards and expectations that glorify God during our dating. And if, you know, now I believe 100% that you, my wife, we need to be intentional about glorifying him in our dating yeah. so that he can glorify us in marriage. Mm -hmm. Why was that important for you? Man. Because every relationship where there weren't standards in place, where mm. sex was the foundation, it all failed. It was all toxic. And I was fresh out of a breakup that left me heartbroken. I just relocated to Dallas from Houston. And I was like, I don't ever want to feel the way I felt then ever again. Good. So I said, I need to change because if nothing changes, nothing changes. There it is. So That's one cool. of the areas that I believe deep down needed to change was me not prioritizing sex mm -hmm. in a relationship and having God be the foundation. Woo. <laughs> Mm, mm, mm. And it's hard, especially when you're young. I mean, yeah. I was 24 years old. You know, I also didn't grow up in church. So I'm still like, ooh, can I go to the club? You know, drinking. Yeah. Like, and I'm not, I wasn't at the time even in a friend group who had the same values. Yes. So I was really struggling. Yeah. But I, I knew deep down that's what we needed to be doing. So at that age, is that where you found Christ? I tw So I was 24 when I met Karen. And it's interesting. So... 21 is when I started to actually build a relationship with Christ. So that's why me telling Carrington this whole abstinence thing, we got to get this together because I had been 
three and a half years yeah. of building a relationship because I knew better. Yeah. It's not like I wasn't educated. Like I knew I was attending the singles conferences. I was reading the books. I was following the, these people who were encouraging it. So I felt so convicted and ashamed. Um, but yeah, so around that age is when I really started growing. So when he told you that, hey, we got to get intentional about what, what, what y'all are doing in a relationship and he sounded like he was like, hey, let's get married. How did you respond to that? Well, was you ready for it? Yes, I was because honestly, we talked about marriage early on. So it was a part of our conversation At 24 years early old. on, 24 and 21. <laughs> talking about marriage. Talking about marriage. <laughs> and we knew, well, I, let me say this. So he communicated it, but then I also communicated that mm -hmm. I believe that God was calling me to really share in this area of relationships and marriage. Yeah. And so I was like, are you on board with that? Like, do you want like, and he was like, yeah, that's cool. You know, like so not knowing what it would look like. Yeah. But when he started to talk about it more seriously, one, I was happy because I'm like, okay, he's not playing games. Cause a lot of the guys that I was talking to they, talking they gonna to say whatever you need to hear. Yeah. But he was actually putting action, um, pursuing me. We did pre, what was it called? Like, it was like pre-engagement. Pre Before we got engagement, we met Before, with a pastor yeah. to, to just talking to them about some of the things that we wanted to deal with. Yeah. So it was just great to see him actually pursuing me and taking the steps that would actually one day lead to us getting engaged. Pre-engagement Pre counseling. And how that happened <laughs> was around this that whole time that same time of us slipping or, you know, having sex, I went to work one day. And I was working in corporate America and there was a woman who, and this was, this is how you know it was God. Cause I was early this day. I remember it was from the weekend. I was early and her name was Miss Jackie. She actually lives in uh, the DeSoto area. But anyway, so Miss Jackie was there. She was like, you know, Hey baby, you know, she's older. She's like, Hey baby, how was your week weekend? And I just started crying. Cause I was like, <laughs> I feel so bad. You know, I met this guy. So I started talking to her and she said, why don't you and him come to my church and have a talk with me. And yeah. that's how it all that's started. Awesome. So we didn't go and and mind you, I'm not like super, uh, you know, yeah. I'm just not, I, it was her idea to meet. So that's why we call it pre-engagement counseling, but mm -hmm. it wasn't like, Ooh, let's do pre-engagement <laughs> counseling. Yeah, no. Like it wasn't nothing like that. It it just, just, she just genuinely yeah. was like, let, let me sit down and talk to you guys. Yeah. So, and that turned into us meeting with her a few times. She ended up doing our premarital counseling, ended up marrying us as well. Yeah. But, um, that's how it happened. So, 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 uh, Carrington, you had some, uh, some advice not to go down that 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 road so early yeah. in your life and where that advice come from we talk about this a lot about uh things that our father tells us our fathers tell us uh the last three episodes was influenced every man talked about the influence of a father yeah. so um what kind of influence did you get so when i brought to my pops that hey man i'm i'm thinking about proposing to ashley i'm thinking about you know hitting that knee his response was i don't think you should do it and so like the specific wording he gave me was, there are experiences of life that I want you to have that I believe that you will miss out on getting married. And so my response at 21 was, I definitely understand that, but when I think about the desires that I have for life, I can do it married, <laughs> right? And so knowing the story and the background- Hold on, you can't, just, you can't <laughs> just drop that like that and think that's just going, you just, I'm gonna let you just slide by with that. You said the experiences of life that you know that you want to have, you can experience it in marriage. 100%, right? So what were you thinking of when he said that? So when I was thinking that, I'm thinking, okay, Carrington, when you think about your desires and what you want, even though at this time I didn't have 100% clarity about what I wanted, I knew I wanted a family. Right. I knew I desired marriage. I knew I wanted to travel. I knew I wanted to impact people. I knew I wanted to love people and serve people and help people. And so for everything concrete in my life that I desired to do, I said, yo, I can do all of that with my boo. Right? So what do you think he was insinuating? So he was insinuating. Show your wild oats. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly, right? Show your wild oats, right? Exactly. Just be out here in these streets. Yeah. Right? yeah. And it's like, when I think about my pops, love them to life. When I think about my pops, from a relational perspective, you know, he's just not, for me, the best example of how to pursue dating and relationships. Right. 
And it's a lot that goes into that just from his background, uh, him not knowing his pops for as long as he did, just yeah. all of those intricacies. But when it comes down to it, that was, you know, it's interesting. I, I've come to realize that, like, God develops and grows us through tough conversations yes. and tough decisions. Like, when you start having tough decisions, tough conversations, like, hey, this is me preparing you in this season and equipping you with the skills necessary for the next season. Yes. Because when I think about the conversation with my pops, when I think about the way I handled the conversation with Ashley where she kicked me out the house, all of this was two couple months following me like quitting football in college, which was like one of the hardest and decisions you in quit? my life. Um, for God, right? And it's funny when I say that to people, they like, wait a minute, what? <laughs> Tell my God don't like football. I know exactly. God loves football in Texas now. And you ain't gonna leave me to believe exactly. that God ain't the God of the Dallas Cowboys. And so <laughs> my situation was like this in regards to that. So I grew up in the church, Baptist church, on the step team, choir, all that, right? <laughs> Grandma used to be on the Usher boys, sit on the back row. You feel me? <laughs> so I grew up in it, but I didn't know what a relationship was with Jesus until my sophomore year of high school, I mean, sophomore year of college. Um, and just walking through the student center one day on the way to practice, ran into some ladies, and young lady called me over. And in my mind, I'm like, man, she about to shoot her shot. I'm going to reject her. She not going <laughs> to get my number, and I'm going to feel bad. She called me over and said, hey, what's your name? I said, I'm Carrington. How are you doing? She said, I'm good. She said, question, what is your relationship like with Jesus? Mm. Right said, out the gate, huh? I'm like, we in college. What you talking about? What you mean? <laughs> what is your relationship like with Jesus? I said, that's my guy. Like, we good. And she said, Jesus requires more of your time and desires to have a better relationship with you. So I'm like, all right, cool. <laughs> so went on about my business. That night, one of my teammates was like, man, met these ladies, bro. I want you to come to Bible study with me. I'm like, I got you. Let's go. Went to Bible study, same ladies. So we're sitting at a table, going through Bible study, going to read Matthew 7. And she just stops, looks at me and says, being a good person won't get you into heaven. And so when I tell the story, I tell people like, the fa that conversation like scared the hell out of me. Like <laughs> I went to my apartment yeah. crying. I walk in, love y'all, love my roommates. My roommates high. I get to telling them about what happened. They like, bro, you done blew my high. Like, yeah, what you life. talking about? And so it's like I had that experience, and that started to just change everything, mm -hmm. which transitioned into me joining a campus ministry, being like the leader of the men. Ended up getting into a relationship before Ashley mm -hmm. that got when I met the, when I looked her in her face, God said, Don't do it. That ain't me. Like, don't do it. You Didn't listen. Anyway. I'm like, This gotta be me. This gotta <laughs> be you, God. Cause I'm like, My preference, this is her. You're right. When, I, when I'm talking to you about wife, God, this is her. Yeah. Cause she looked like preference. Yeah. But I, I was just on a car the other day. I was telling my clients, Hey, like, preference is lust. Because mm -hmm. when you think about what you prefer, it's all about you. Mm -hmm. And let's be honest, like what makes you horny? And mm -hmm. What you're attracted to? Yeah. And what you desire to? So preference is really lust. Yes. Whole other conversation. Mm -hmm. And so got in a relationship, went through nine months, got out of that relationship. And during the time I was still playing football, but started to feel a pull away from it. And so stopped going to the campus ministry because of a, my last injury, which is separating my shoulder. Mm. Went to a Bible, went to a, a, a Sunday, yeah, like a Sunday Bible study. In that conversation, president of the campus ministry said, Carrington, uh, do you trust God? I said, yes. Talk, talk, talk. Got to the point of her saying, Carrington, I hear what you're saying, but your actions don't align with it. If you believe that God is who he say he is, mm -hmm. and you believe God telling you to let go of football, if you're supposed to be playing football, God will bring it back to you. Woo! Broke down crying, drove to Dallas. I had locks. Cut my locks off the next morning, didn't go to practice. Went to my coach and said, hey, like, I'm done, coach. Like, God is calling me to something different. What did he say? He was like, what? <laughs> like, so my D coordinator was like, I played linebacker. He was like, what? <laughs> like, okay. And then I had a conversation with my head coach. And he was like, hey, you know, I understand it happens, right? You know, I, I knew you were different from the time I met you because we had a new coaching staff. Mm -hmm. And he was like, I knew you were different. And I knew you were led by something bigger than just you. Mm. So he was like, I respect it. Um, and so it's funny because like, like I was saying, like that conversation, that uncomfortable conversation led me to meeting Ashley, her, her uncomfortable conversation. Yeah. Then led me to the conversation with pops, which was an <laughs> uncomfortable conversation. And then it's like, look at we, look at where we are now. Now y'all on, uh, y'all have your own platform having uncomfortable conversations. conversations. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> your whole platform is uncomfortable conversations. Exactly. <laughs> 
So we, I know you probably heard this story time and time again. How do you feel when you hear that story? I think it's I think it's all divine timing because yes. shortly after that happened, I think it was like three months later we met oh, one yeah. another. Oh, so yeah. I'm just like, man, what if you he would have stayed in that relationship yep. or continue to play? You know, so it just it was all in alignment. So when y'all took the marriage vow, love, cherish, and obey. I mean, y'all may have not said that term because like I said, that word was omitted. When you hear the word, we're gonna unpack this little by little. When you hear the word love, how do you, how do you feel like your marriage was tested or y'all uh, endured the challenge of love? And when I talk about love, I'm talking about 1 Corinthians 13, 100%. like that level of love. Mm. So I think the initial response is not being educated about what love actually is. There it is, now let's talk. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now we can talk. Yeah. yeah, so when we look at love, especially culture now, mm -hmm. it has nothing to do with the true meaning of it and everything to do with feelings. Yes. I feel like this. Yeah. Because I have these feelings, this must be love. When in actuality, if we go through 1 Corinthians 13 and we observe God, Jesus Christ on mm -hmm. the planet and how he moved, it yeah. wasn't about feelings. It was all about commitment yeah. and sacrifice mm -hmm. and choosing you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we talk about the feelings, I let people know, hey, I understand what you're saying with these butterflies. And, yet, you know, a lot of times when love happens, we feel that. But love, lust, and infatuation, I all have that feeling. And, well, a lot of, and a lot of people are making covenant decisions off of those temporary feelings. Yeah. You, you using these butterflies and this excitement you feel as the, the motivator or the push to get married mm. when that ain't got nothing to do with love. Mm. That's just a temporary feeling. Talk about right? it. Right. Love happens after that. Yeah. Right. Because because those feelings can get you to the I do. But what's going to keep you in the I do mm. and waking up saying that every day, mm -hmm. not just with your words, but your actions, because love is hard. And that's what people don't understand. Mm -hmm. And that's what people don't want to accept. Like so, it's challenging to love. So, so let's, let, let, let's, let's read this, 1 Corinthians 13. It says, okay. love is patient. Mm. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. We're going to come back to that. <laughs> love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. And verse 8 says, love never fails. Have y'all ever dealt with situations in your marriage where it's because the hardest thing is keeps no records of wrong. Mm -hmm. mm. How is that even possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your spouse does something one day and and they ask for forgiveness. Yeah. And then a couple of days later, you know, you'd be like, see, see just yesterday. Now you yeah. I, you, yeah. you said you wasn't gonna. Mm. Let's talk about that. Yeah, no, one hundred percent. And a revelation that I received the past couple of years that we've been married is one of, I had trust issues, not because of fidelity or anything like that, but mm -hmm. because Carrington, he would say he was going to do something and not do it right. or even mm -hmm. dreams and goals. Right. You're pursuing things that you say you're going to do, but you give up on it. So it's like, I don't have, so now when you bring another idea, yep. I'm not, I don't have that much faith and trust. And it's hard to be a help me to someone who you're like, okay, how long, you, you, hold how long yeah. you know, okay, you have this idea, you put you motivated to do it, then you switch to a different one. And so I had to, one day we went on a walk. Remember that evening we went on a walk and I was like, you know what? I'm going to forget all of these extra things that you said yeah. you're going to do. <laughs> and, I, and I'll just like focus on the present because I was keeping a record of it. And it's a different kind of, it's not necessarily a wrong, but it was. But it's a wrong a, to you a, because, a because the type of woman that you are, you're a mover and shaker. So you're, you're the type of person I've seen your Instagram stuff. You you literally write the vision, make it plain, and you accomplish it. Yeah. Exactly. And so when someone else does something that's inconsistent, it's like, hold on. Because that's totally against your whole thought process. Exactly. It, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so and so I would say that's where I've struggled. What about you? hundred percent. And so just to piggyback on that, and I think when we talk about the um, obey piece, we can get into that a little bit more because that yeah. affects it. But I think that you know, for me, one of the challenges for me has been in my mind, 
thinking or feeling that everybody is like me and thinks like me, right? I'm a very loving, caring, nurturing, doing, thoughtful individual. So like everything, I'm not just thinking about me. I'm thinking about everybody else right. and my decision making. Right. And so Ashley would do some things, make some decisions, hurt my feelings. And I'm like, really? <laughs> like, like, As, what? like, like you like, would really give, do that? Give an example. Yeah, I'm like, so, like what? So here, so here, <laughs> this has been my biggest challenge with Ashley in our relationship, right? The tone that she come at me with sometimes, right? So Ashley grew up primarily a single mom. It's her and her three sisters. Yeah. Yeah. So I all they do, the first time I met her sisters, one of them was outside on the porch, but I walked down, I walked in the house downstairs. The other one, yeah, I'm this, that, and the other. I know you heard about me. The other one, <laughs> oh, just, everybody just yelling and loud. And I'm like, for me, that's my norm. Facts. But I don't like that. Yeah. Like, I don't want that. Yeah. Because I grew up single parent household and I love my mama. Like, yeah. my mama, we had the same birthday. So, like, Dang, that's, that's, my, cool. that's my dude. I yeah. love my mama. But my mama, on from the hood. <laughs> And she she a cuss you out in a second <laughs> and get loud and so for me I'm like I don't want I don't that. want that I don't want to marry and so that. when Ashley would come in with that tone that she adopted as a result of growing in her up in her house yep. I'm like yo you better watch your tone yeah and my my real battle is I grew up having anger issues so I was the punch a hole in the wall type of guy I'm angry like <laughs> yeah. I'm pissed so I'm about to express it like this yeah and my thing in marriage has been. How do I express myself transparently in this marriage without doing it like that? And a big piece of that was really getting understanding yes. about me, who I am, how I'm wired, but then her, who she is and how she wired. Talk about A lot of times when she would come at me with a specific tone or even come at me with criticism, I would get offended because I'm like, yo, why are you criticizing me, judging me? But what I had to realize is that Carrington, this is your teammate. We're on the same team. Mm. So she's not judging you or criticizing you. She's criticizing your process. Your process. Hold on, stop. hold on, hold on, hold on. Just marinate real quick because that's speaking to me. I knew that, that was a, that was one of my biggest flaws in my past marriage. Okay. Is that my wife would tell me like, I'm trying to help you. And she said, she used to tell me, you receive help from everybody else except me. Mm. And you know, the difference was is because again, she was four years older than me okay. and I felt like I had something to prove to her. Wow. You know, I felt like, I felt like I, you know, I had to show her that I could take care of her. I had to show her all this stuff. And so, and it played a very negative effect on my life once before I ever got married, I was touring shows across the country. And once I got to a certain level financially, I said, now I deserve a wife. Mm. And then I got my wife who I was dating at the time got her and then when financial uh hardship hit i was like i don't deserve to be married no more mm. Mm. because my value of taking on a wife was focused on the provider aspect versus the the covering the spiritual covering and everything that that entails yeah. and but so when she would try to help me she'd be like i want to give you some advice i'd be like oh, i got it yeah. i got it Definitely. i got it I got it i'm with you and then and then when someone else would tell me hey why don't you do this with i said yeah yeah we should yeah that makes it good <laughs> And she would just watch me. She's like, why is it that I could tell you something and then somebody else? And I'd just be like, I don't even know what you're talking about. Yeah, but it makes a lot of sense, though, <laughs> yeah. because as men, it's like we want to be the leader. We want to be the head. Yes. We want to be directed and guided, cast a vision and making these decisions. And so in moments where it's like, hey, you're giving me advice, a lot of times in our mind, it's like now she's going to see me as less than there it is. because I needed some help from her Yes, because of the ideologies that us as men, especially black men grew yes. up with yes. being installed in our mind, which is all negative and lies. And it's just tough it out, figure it out. Do, <laughs> yeah. do, do, go, A real go, man go. will know how to figure this out. Uh, uh, exactly. <laughs> and so because of all of that, that just places the limiting beliefs. And you know, what you said was so big and I hope people caught it because it's a real eye opener to the necessity of, valuing the preparation for marriage mm -hmm. over the marriage. There it is. Like if, if you're not, in, if you're more intentional in your desire for marriage than actually preparing for it, you're not, you're not ready for marriage. Not at all. Because mm -hmm. in order to, marriage is, listen. <laughs> it's the hardest thing you could do in life. Listen, and it's just because of the consistency of it. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Right. And, you know, science says naturally we're growing apart. Yeah. Which means that in order for us to stay close, we have to work. Yeah. yeah. But not. That's good. I didn't say I have to work. We. We have to work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So how can two walk together unless they agree? There it is. If we're not in alignment on the same page and both in a position where we're, here comes the word, submitted mutually mm-hmm. and willing to do the work, throw in the towel. It's not going to happen. Yeah. Ooh, ask her what you got to say. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm about to fan. Yeah. I'm over here. Drop so, why, so, why, so why is Carrington going in right now? He over, he over Listen, preaching. This, this is Carrington's gift, okay? Man, you, you know, can tell. I, I just, <laughs> he, I mean, he said it all and he said it best. But one thing that Carrington <laughs> did say I love is the consistency. The piece. consistency of because, marriage. Because you mentioned it, like one of your initial questions about yeah. love, like, in that in the beginning you have that feeling and then once you get four five six seven eight years you know once you get married it's the consistency and that intentionality that Mm -hmm. keeps you liking one another and wanting to be around each other Mm -hmm. and i believe that marriage is a gift it comes with many blessings it should be enjoyed you know and one of i think one of the reasons why carrington and i do work so well together is because we are both on we are both committed to one making marriage look great again be great again being an example for this generation that you what you see in the media is not facts there it is because if cameras were to follow me and carrington around we it it would be so boring (laughs) you know when you when you're happily married and there's not a lot of drama it's very boring yeah so it so it's just it's really that consistency and understanding that man Love is consistent and it's just, it really, you said it really well. And just one thing I want to add. So when she says like, it's boring. I know you about that. You know what I'm saying? Not in the sense of we don't enjoy it. Yeah. But it's just that you don't see a whole lot of antics and craziness going on that you would see on a reality show. Look, uh, love and hip hop and all them what. We don't look like that. Yeah. yeah. We don't yeah. look like like we actually like each other. Yeah. Exactly. Like and that like we like each other. <laughs> yeah. We ain't gonna just be fighting for nothing. Yeah. They be stirring up stuff. Now we're gonna go to the word cherish. Mm. Cherish means to hold dear, feel, or show affection for, uh, to keep or cultivate with care and affection. Um, nurture. They said they're using a marriage in this term. Yeah. Nurture cherishes his marriage. Uh, to entertain or harbor in the mind deeply and resolutely. Mm. I like that. To entertain or harbor in the mind deeply and resolutely. How does that apply to y'all? And how do you feel about that when it pertains to your marriage? Can you say that last line one more time? To entertain or harbor in the mind deeply and resolutely. Okay. And I love that it mentioned the mind. Yes. Because I, I think when you are married, you should have a good perception of your spouse in your mind Mm. Mm. and Mm. when you have the proper perspective of your spouse it's easy to cherish them but if i'm showing up in public acting some type of way just because i want to be respectful but in my mind i'm like oh he don't know what he's doing oh he you know it's going to affect your behavior so i think you have the right perspective in your mind it's easy to cherish 100 and so when i hear the definition of cherish two things pop in my head um, producer mindset and love languages. So the producer mindset is the mindset that you have to have in order to thrive in relationships and really in life in general, right? You don't go into interaction and connection with the perspective of, Hey, what can you do for me? But right. you ask yourself, what can I do from you? Right? I tell all my clients, Hey, when you, when it comes to people, the foundational expectation that you should have is to learn something. Only thing you should expect from people is to teach you something mm. because it, you, you don't have to even talk or interact with somebody for you to learn something. There it is. And so I think that when we talk about cherishing somebody, it's about adopting a producer mindset and living in a relationship from the perspective of how can I serve them? Mm. How can I love them today? Right. The other day um, I bought my boo, um, what is it? Edible arrangements mm-hmm. because what was that? I think last Valentine's day I bought him and she loved him. Cause I, and I, she was like, oh, that's so nice. Thank you. And I was like, you know, baby, I just, like, I just don't feel like I've been appreciating you expressing me enough verbally. Yes. But like, and I know gifts isn't your primary love language, but like, I know you said you enjoyed it. So let me do it. Cause she's on my mind as you talked about it. In okay. So let me ask you before he did that, were you feeling that you weren't being cherished at the moment? 
I was feeling annoyed because our <laughs> schedules have been conflicting and yeah. I'm, I really like, I love him around all the time, but now like he got three or four evenings where he's gone and I'm just like, man, you been, I haven't <laughs> been seeing you. Yeah. And so that's how I felt deep down. But on the outside, I was probably having a little attitude walking around the house. <laughs> what, so did you have attitude, Carrington? Could you uh, sense yeah. it? I felt it in my spirit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I had a little, a little saltiness. And so, but when he, when I woke up and I saw, it, I was like, okay, well, now I can tell you why I've been feeling the way I've been feeling. So. <laughs> and look, I'm happy that she gets upset when I'm not around because there's yeah. some married people that's like, yeah, I good. love, I love when you go right. And look, <laughs> yeah, no, not me. And I made a pivot in my life to clear up another evening. <laughs> Be, two of them things is like, I gotta have ease. Yeah. But it's like, I've removed something because I'm like, yo, like, nothing matters more than this. Than the happiness like, of if, my wife. If my wife not good, I don't care about none of y'all. Yep. yep. And that's just how I am. Yeah. And so just to, the part two of what I was saying with the definition, the love language, right? So when we talk about cherishing somebody, I just think about loving them how they receive love. Yes. Right? So even though I gave her a gift, her primary love language is acts of service. Mm -hmm. And so I'm, I've, I've always been, so when we talk about gender roles, uh, I'm good on that, right? Like yeah. we a team, we a partnership. If something needs to get done, exactly. let's get it done. Exactly. So I'm an advocate of like waking up and, you know, I just, this, I straightened up the room this morning, picked up all, this, all that type of stuff yeah. because that's just how I am. But when I found out that, you know, when we retook the test and I found out her primary love language was acts of service, I became more intentional about, hey, how can you take something off her plate? Yeah. How can you make her day easier? And after having kids, my love language changed. It did? So, yeah, so I think that's important, too. You know, people who are familiar with love languages to take it more than once because it yeah. can change. So what was it before? Um, quality time yeah. was my number one quality she was time. Like, you think you want some. After having kids. <laughs> you was like, I need somebody to help me with the kids. Exactly. Yes, acts of service. If you can, <laughs> if you can bathe them, light cook a meal, low. man, you all right with me. So how long did you find out that it's shifted? Like where, you know, cause that's interesting because if you had a kid and the kid is four years old and it's shifted three years prior and he's still trying to serve you in the, in the, in the wrong love language, which you may not be receptive of, but he don't know. He like, well, we took the test. Why is yeah. she tripping on this? I'm doing this for her and she's not receiving it. Did you ever find when you, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty? can you think back and go, yeah, I, I realized that it started shifting around about year two of our first child or whatever. Yeah. Well, no, I know probably instantly when we started having kids. <laughs> she said instantly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, definitely. But I didn't realize it until we took the test again. And yeah. I was surprised, but I'm like, but this is actually really accurate. <laughs> 100%. So and it's and and so I would advise, I'd be advising couples yo every six twelve months y'all need to take that yeah because with season change and love language as well and the reason why it's so important to continue to take them is because if I assume this is your love language and I'm loving you like that mm -hmm. but you're not receiving that yes. I'm going to feel like you don't value me that's what I'm and talking about you don't about. appreciate the effort yeah. that I'm putting yeah. out so and then it's like it's not a matter of her not appreciating it she just changed and that's okay it's interesting so. My mother-in-law is amazing. I love my mother-in-law. She's so awesome. And for me, I think she should be on stage traveling the world, speaking and investing to people. Uh, but she she's very like introverted. Oh, she, she is? Ain't, she ain't trying to talk to nobody. <laughs> but if you do talk to her, she'll talk. She got stories for days. But one of the interesting, rest, interesting things she said one day is, she said, I believe that married couples should have a meeting once a year and ask each other, are you okay with the way that I've changed? That's exactly what I said. Mm. I had wrote that in my journal because I've been taking notes about what I, I said it's crazy because corporations, they'll sit down and uh, they'll talk about, they'll have these team meetings and talk about uh, the vision for the company and all that type of stuff and find out what well, they'll have. I said, this is going to be really funny because I said in the dating process, you should do those, um, um, what is it called? Entry, the annual interview. reviews, like review, uh, yeah. annual yeah. reviews or whatever, and sit down and be like, so, uh, and then each couple, the, the, each partner gives the couple, these are areas of growth that we need to mm. see. And the other person says, yeah, I think that, you know, from a communication standpoint, every time I talk to you, shut down, uh, mm. that, that I, I feel a certain way about that. Mm -hmm. Can you work on that? Uh, you're not spending enough time with me. Can you work on that? Yeah. And just yeah. literally write it down. I ain't talking about just having a conversation, literally write it down, spend yeah. time writing it down, hand it to the other person. They review it. And they go, okay, I'll work on this. This is area of need. But mm -hmm. also put the things that you like about them. I love the fact 
that you do this on my birthday. You surprised me. That was so beautiful when you did yeah. that. I love how you took care of my mom for this. Just write down mm -hmm. all that stuff, just like you would do in the job, and then give them that, and then check back six months or a year and see if those uh, areas have seen growth. That's a great love idea. that idea. It's like it's like I wrote that down uh, probably about four months ago, and I said that's how I'm gonna treat my next marriage, my wow. next relationship. We're going to sit down in a whole dating process and look at all that because we give more attention to our jobs and everything that they do isn't just by happenstance. It's a structure and they go, this is how it is. And then you'll watch the company grow yeah. when you get all members on the same, uh, same playing field. Wow. Somebody's going to hear you say that and have the thought, he that's doing too much. I know. Yeah. Like that's what they're gonna say, yo, he doing too much. But in actuality, like that's the type of investment that yeah. you need to make. One thing Ash and I used to do is um probably need to, we didn't need to bring it back, but we used to do marriage recaps. Yeah. So every Sunday we would rate on a A, B, C, D, F scale. <laughs> intimacy. Intimacy, communication, communication uh, time with just different areas. That's yeah. good. And then we would say, okay, what do what do you need me to work on? What is like the one thing that you want me to do better good. or be intentional about this week? And it's like, that stuff is necessary. Oh my God. Because when we talk about year review, I heard somebody talking about like casinos. And it's like mm -hmm. casinos, they check in numbers and doing reviews three, four, five times a night. Yeah. Because if they don't, they're they going to lose. Bankrupt. They're going to lose. Exactly. Yeah. They need to find out when to shut this table down. <laughs> and so it's like, you need to treat your marriage, marriage like that business. Yeah. Like that thriving corporation. Yeah. If you don't check it on a consistent basis, do a risk analysis there it is. on a consistent basis. Yeah. You about to drive off the cliff and don't even know. And yeah. that's what happens. That's when you hear couples say, we just grew apart. That mm. means that you didn't give enough attention to that marriage from a daily or weekly or monthly. Uh, you can't just, a company just don't say, we just don't know why we just can't keep our employees no more. They have this thing called employee retention. Right. And they go, they'll ask people, uh, are they happy here? What, you know, they'll find out all this stuff in which they found out a lot during COVID is that people preferred working from home and they got greater productivity. Yeah. At first they said, if we had people at home, it ain't no way they are gonna be working. Yeah. Yeah. But then they said, aha. So a lot of companies said, we are gonna just leave people at home because we're getting better productivity out of them at home. Mm -hmm. Wow, who'd have thought that? And, um, and our company is seeing growth. And so in a marriage it's the same way as saying that, why are we all, why are we miserable? Cause yeah. if you get a couple that's miserable, it didn't happen in year seven. Mm. You know, um, um, year seven, they talk about has been the seven year itch. That's the time when people decide to say, you know what, I'm most divorces happen around year seven. Yeah. And, and, but what about six? What about five? What about four and three? Yeah. It's something that started happening. And then you begin to say, all right, this is just how our marriage is going to be. 100%. And the minute you accept that, like a company don't say, oh, you just come late. You're just going to be late every day. We don't care. You just yeah. come late. You, you, ah, yeah. you take four hour lunches. That's just, that's just how it is. You know, they're gonna be like, hold on. You, we gonna first of all, <laughs> we're gonna put you on probation, you know, and yeah. we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and walk you out the door. And and marriage can be protected more if we had a handle on it and actually, you know, watched it closely. Hundred mm. yeah. percent. It's interesting you brought up that seven year. Man, I watched a, a, a movie on Hulu about two months ago, and it was about a woman who was doing a documentary trying to prove that marriage should be a seven year contract in which when you get married, you get married for seven years. And then after seven years, you come together and you say, Hey, do I want it to be over? Or I want to keep going. That's a movie. That's a movie. I'm gonna have to find the name of it and let you check it out. Cause that's exactly <laughs> what she did. Wow. All right. That's, that's, that's but it resulted the, her challenge resulted in all the couples that she were interviewing and checking out and trying to force it quit. They all were like, no, I'm not going anywhere. This is who I want to be with. Mm. So it backfired in the face, but it was like the same seven year. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'll tell you a little bit about where that came from uh, after we get finished recording this. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that's, that, that's powerful. Now, when we look at the, the vow obey, mm -hmm. um, I was reading an article in Time Magazine where uh, Meghan Markle and, and her husband, when they got married, they, you know, according to the British culture, they will make sure they remove that out um, mm -hmm. of the vow. And they elected to write their own vow in that place. But obey has always been a negative thing. When you hear that, first of all, let me ask you that. I'm gonna say it to you, Ashley. Uh, did you make a vow to love, cherish, and obey Carrington? 
That's what she said, wasn't it? When <laughs> she married us. I think I, she might have. She might have just we'll threw back the video. Yeah, she might have to, said it. Yeah, we're going to have to um, <laughs> listen to it again. But if she did or didn't, I would say yes. Why? Either way. Why would that word obey? Obey isn't intimidating to me. It's not. Especially if you're... So I know the type of person, the type of man that I married, he is not controlling. And so if there's an area where he's like very firm in something, I'm like really leaning in because usually, you know, he's like, <laughs> you know, he's he's kind of go with the flow a little bit. But for me, obey, submission, it's not intimidating, which is very interesting because I am a very, you know, leadership minded person, especially running a company like I, that's, I don't know. It's just, it's different being married to someone who, who doesn't have the characteristics of someone who is super controlling my way or the highway. We're both very agreeable. Mm -hmm. do, 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 do you see why a lot of women and how, and how they omitted that out of the original marriage vows um, as time progressed. Do you see why they did that? Yeah, I, I understand. And I, I understand the mindset women have who, who that word obey, it's like a, a slap in the face. Like, why do I have to obey you type of <laughs> attitude? You know, and so I, I understand the culture that we're in, but if you're yoked up with the right person, it's not going to be as harsh. I remember Fantasia went viral when she was talking to her, her and her husband. She talked about submission. It was saying that if women knew how to submit more, then they could get married and get a husband, all that type of stuff. And people were like, mm. oh, my God. I mean, people was, oh, they mm. was like, oh, did you just, it, it went crazy. But yeah. the way she spoke about it uh, was so powerful. And I do believe that most men, I ain't gonna say most, I hate using terms like this. I do believe that some men have abused that word submission. Absolutely. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, especially when you go back to the beginning of time, women had no rights. Mm. They couldn't even own property. And so a man knew that. So he knew that he can control you um, and control your livelihood yeah. uh, just by, if he decided to divorce you, you're destitute. Like he mm. like, you're done. And then you're like, you're, so when we talk, we listen, we, you know, we read the book about the Bible and we read about Ruth and, you know, Boaz or whatever. She was destitute. She didn't, she didn't have mm. nothing. So, so, it's a whole different type of ideology. So when you look mm -hmm. at the word submission, a lot of women see it from an abusive standpoint and say, I hate that. Um, Carrington, when you hear the word submission and, and uh, maybe you've dealt with anything, you know, like I said, you, you married a very powerful woman. Yeah. She's three years your senior. Uh, you said she had all her stuff together. Uh, had a had a house together, had a good job. You had a house at twenty four. No it apartment. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So you had your own place. You 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 you're doing well. Corporate America job and all that good stuff. Um, did you run in any issues dealing with a woman um, that has a leadership mindset? A lot of them. <laughs> a lot of them. Um, because of what I lacked, right? So one of the things that my my pop said in that exact same conversation was. Carrington understand that if you get married to this woman, she's going to have an expectation of you three years beyond where you are. Mm. Right? <laughs> so his perspective was you're 21, she's 24. She's going to have a 24-year-old expectation from you. And so I took that perspective in, and I just used to just go, 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 go. Do, 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 do. Like I was just always moving because it's like, okay, I got to, like you expressed, like yeah. prove myself. Yeah. And um, that was challenging. I beat myself up, tore myself down. And so me now, I understand submission. And I understand why women run from it and avoid it. But it's because society has painted it as slavery. Yes. In society's mind, submission looks like coming to America. Yeah. Right? Whatever you like. Right, yeah. yeah. Jump, Whatever you like. bark like a dog. How? Yeah. That's the perception, right? Yeah. When submission is really you entrusting somebody to lead God and direct you. Yeah. That's what it is. Now, here, here's, here's, here goes some controversy right here um, for my kings. I've come to realize that if a woman isn't submitted to you, uh -oh. that's not her fault. There it is. Uh -oh. It's uh -oh. your fault. There it is. Because the Bible says that mutual submission brings reverence to God, which means we're supposed to submit to each other. 
more controversy. Men being a leader, King, you're supposed to submit first. Not to her, but to God. Because by you submitting to God and her watching the fruit that comes from you submitting to God, mm -hmm. that's going to inspire and persuade yeah. her, but then teach her how to submit to you. Talk about it. So if she's not submitting, you the issue, King. You're not giving her anything to submit to. Two. You better... Boy, uh, Rihanna about to catch the Holy Ghost over there. Rihanna, <laughs> Rihanna, 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 Rihanna is... Uh, yeah, yeah. Rihanna, Rihanna's doing the live switch, and shout out to Rihanna. She about to, she about to tear the whole studio up. She felt the Holy Spirit at that point. I'm about to run around this thing, because in the letter that each episode ends with me writing a letter to my future wifey, and you just nailed exactly what I wrote in my in, in my in my letter, mm. and it's saying that, like I said, they'll see it at the end of this episode. Yeah. But but the reality is exactly that. Yeah. That as men, as leaders, the Bible says, and the Bible says, submit ye one to another. Yeah. Yeah. And so the powerful thing about that is for a great leader, they say what makes a great leader is him being a great follower. Mm -hmm. So if he's able to look at his wife and go, I'm gonna submit to this. It's not, it's not saying I'm submitting to her in every way and all that, she's the leader. Yeah. It's saying I can submit, submit ye one to another, meaning that there'll be instances, thank you Holy Spirit, because I never even looked at it like this, that there'll be instances where you will have to submit what you think is right to what is actually right. 100%. Mm. Because you're hearing from God, you be like, you know what? You actually are right in that. Yeah. I'm not right in this. So I submit what I thought was right <clears throat> to what I believe is really right and God is leading you in this. One thing that's powerful about a woman is that she's a visionary. Um, a woman, um, I will never forget this, Pastor Gordon Banks, when he married me and my ex-wife, he said, a woman comes into a house and make it a home. Mm -hmm. and, and, the, and, the, and the woman has that powerful thing. I used to watch my mom go into the kitchen. If she sent me in the kitchen to go, say, you know, go fix you something to eat, I would walk in there and be like, it ain't nothing in here to eat. Exactly. It ain't nothing ain't in here. Nothing here. <laughs> She'd say, child, move out the way. She come up there like, how did you? Okay, are you Jesus? Because did you get like, how did this stuff appear? They know how to go and grab some stuff out of the refrigerator, out the pantry, and create a whole meal to feed all seven of us. Mm -hmm. You know, and I was just like, I don't. And I remember at a young age seeing that and saying, I think mamas are magical. Like mm. they are magical. They know how to do stuff with very little resources and create something that's powerful. Um, and if mm. we're too prideful to see our our wives, our helpmates, our teammates, as such, then you've, 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 you've screwed up. 100%. One of the best books that made the biggest impact on me as a man is um, Kingdom Man. Mm. Tony, Tony Evans. Evans. Right? That was my counsel. That book. I said every time we have that, episodes. Look, that book blessed my soul as a man because it really gave me the understanding and the wisdom that, hey, Carrington, when you look at the world, 99% of the problems that you see are a result of a man choosing not to be a man. And it forced me to go find out what a man was because I, my definition was, <laughs> wasn't it. Like, mm. my definition was not right. And so I had to go understand what a man is. And the challenge even with that is the, the true definition and the true image of man. Yes. Male, I'm going to say grown males, adult males nowadays yes. will reject that. Oh, you weak. Mm -hmm. Oh, you soft. Oh, you ain't right. You cooking what you, when in actuality, it's like, well, wait a minute. Yes. If I'm a Christian and I follow Christ, he's my example of man. I'm supposed to walk in alignment with him. He was a servant. He was a nurture. Like he was the first nurturer. Women are nurturing, but he was the foundational nurturer. And see, they don't want to talk about like serving. Serving seems like, again, slavery. You know, it's like I'm gonna serve you. I'm gonna serve. I'm gonna serve my wife. Or no, I'm gonna sit here. You serve me. Go, go, go. Fix me a plate to eat. Mm -hmm. I need you. To go give me this. Go get my remote control. Go give me. Go give me a magazine. Go get me. Mm -hmm. And that's what servitude looks like. Instead of saying, "Baby, okay, you need anything? I'm gonna get ready to go do this. You, you before I go do this, you need anything before or I go on there? your way back yeah. home. You need me to grab something from the store. Look, you need me to stop by Seven Eleven, grab some Rolos. <laughs> <laughs> Just simple. Yeah. And we and, and it's crazy because the person that's uh, supposed to be walking alongside of us, we're in competition with. Mm -hmm. And we don't even realize, like, why are you trying to make my life? The beauty of a marriage is that you now have a partner that should be concerned about your well-being. Yeah. And their main priority is saying, how can I make your life easier? But as men, how am I supposed to receive that if I was raised to believe that I don't matter, 
My feelings and emotions Talk about don't it. matter. My tears don't matter. I can't cry because if I cry, I'm a punk and I'm soft. Like, how am I supposed to believe that somebody actually wants the truth of me and the mm -hmm. transparency of me when I've been raised to believe this? And that's one of the things that we ran into. We, I, don't, I don't even remember the situation, but we were on our way back from Wichita because that's where Ashley's from. Mm -hmm. And she was like, I don't know how we got on the topic, but she was like, you know, like, why don't you talk to me? Why don't you share stuff with me? And I was like, yo, I don't feel like you. I don't believe you care. Like, mm. you don't, in my mind, you do not care. And she was like, yo, I do. Like, I want to know. And so that's a danger. The follow-up to that conversation is dangerous because a lot of women desire men to be transparent, but they not ready for them to be transparent. Talk about it. Because I tell women all the time, look, if you want your, if you have an issue with the communication of your man, you have to create a safe space for him to be communic yeah. for, for him to be transparent. But then you also have to let him know, hey, I'm on your team, we good. Yeah. <clears throat> and then the challenge comes in when he chooses to be transparent, how do you, do you respond or you react? <laughs> Because if you go just tell them, I'll oh, suck it up, deal Stop with like right everybody there. else. No, hold on, hold on, hold on. Do you respond or do you react? Exactly. Because see, people don't understand what that mean, characters. So you got to take them slow. What's okay. the difference between responding and reacting? So when we react to a situation, it's all feelings. Yes, yeah. all it's emotions. It's all emotions. No time yeah. to process. It's, yeah. When we respond, I'm using logic, yeah. wisdom, processing. And then I, and this is the thing reacting and responding. There's not a big difference in the time. Yeah. It's a proactive thing. You yes. have to equip yourself before the situation to whether or not you're going to react or respond. Because if I'm mentally if I'm mentally weak and emotionally immature, I'm, a I'm re always going to respond. Yeah, react. If I'm, I'm going to react. If I'm mentally tough and emotionally mature, I'm going to respond yeah. because I'm built like this. Yeah. I'm built like this. Mm. And so women have to be careful in those situations because – that might be, that could be the only time he ever does it. So let me tell you something. It's interesting because in our last episode, um, and for better, for worse, that's what my boy Jewel said. He said in his moment of uh, vulnerability, he shared, and he never disclosed what he shared, but he shared something with his, uh, with his wife and clearly she reacted. And he said, I shut down and I said, I'll never, ever be vulnerable again. Mm. And people don't understand. If men are very, we're fragile. Oh, yeah. we are extremely yeah. fragile Man. and sensitive. Mm -hmm. And we will keep a secret until we die. And when you have a man open up and share something with you, and and even if you can't respond immediately, because if you're not equipped to respond, take a moment and go, yeah. hmm, be quiet. Just be quiet and take it in. And he'd be like, did you hear me? Yeah, I just want to make sure that I respond correctly. That was, thank you. Thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you. Mm. Shame is a savage, man. And look, shame will persuade you to disconnect yourself and divorce yourself from your destiny. Shame will tell you because of what you've been through, because of what you've done, you don't deserve none of that. Mm. When God says, Jesus says, hey, because I died for you before you even here, I pre-qualified you for every blessing that I have ordained for you. Whew, let's go here to uh, <laughs> Ephesians 5, because this you, you, know, you don't got all into the word, so we finna just stay there. <laughs> so Ephesians 5 and 21 says, submit you to one another out of reverence for Christ. Mm. I've never even looked at that scripture like that. I always heard submit you one to another, but it says out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, mm -hmm. cleansing her by the washing with the water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. I want to stop right here because the Bible doesn't even speak about a wife loving her husband because all, most of the time that's just kind of automatic. But it was specific in saying, husband, love your wife. Because again, back in those days, wives were viewed as property, mm -hmm. you know, and a, and a man just be like, I've married her or whatever. And there's no, it's no big, she gonna give me some kids. What, you couldn't give me a son? Oh, get, get rid of her. Let me give me somebody that give me a son. Mm -hmm. Like it was just, it was so sad that the Lord had to put in the Bible, husbands, love your wife. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like just love her as, 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 as Christ loved the church. Uh, so when you hear that, um, 
when you hear that, what do you what do you think about Ashley? When you when it, when the Bible says husbands love your wife as Christ loved the church. I think that's the ideal situation. But it also the whole scripture makes me initially think about choosing wisely from the jump. Mm. You know, if when you <laughs> When the Bible clearly tells wives to submit to their husband, don't you want to make sure it's the right type of person? Yeah, that you submit to. Yeah. So initially, I'm just like, man, you got to choose. This works if you choose the right person. <laughs> but it backfires if you don't. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yes. Carrington want to say something. Look at me itching. He itching. Uh, I just think that's just so big what she says about choosing. Um, because choosing... Marriage changes every area of your life. Yes. And, you know, I talked about it earlier on one of my calls, but it's like, in a lot of cases, marriage is like a life or death decision in the sense of if you choose to settle for a marriage that doesn't reflect God, then you're going to be settling for the rest of your life you choose to say. That means you're neglecting yourself, rejecting yourself, Talk not prioritizing yourself, mm -hmm. creating insecurities, creating lack of value, creating low self-esteem. And you're, you're experiencing and living your life of dis-ease, which is going to create disease in your body. Mm. And now you attacking you because of the situation that you chose to be in that you knew wasn't in alignment with the excellence that God ordained for you. Yeah. And I feel like excellence is the perfect word. Yes. Having your husband love you like Christ loved the church, that's an excellent way of doing marriage. And it's the only way to do marriage because marriage is a reflection of the relationship between Christ and the church. Yes. Which is why one of the primary advice, pieces of advice I give engaged men and husbands, King, you got to die. Yes. If you ain't dying, you ain't doing it right. Like, mm. you need to be <laughs> dying every day. And just like we as the church trip out of line, disrespectful, go against God, all this type of stuff, it's okay for your wife to act like that because she a reflection of you in Jesus' <laughs> eyes. So for me, it's like, and here's what I, I told a friend this about a month and a half ago. Even if your wife is being a bad wife, like not based on your standards, yeah. but the expectation given by God, that doesn't give you permission to be a bad husband. Because mm. you didn't create covenant with just her. Yeah. You created covenant with God. And because you made a covenant to be a reflection of the sacrifice and the love of his son, Jesus Christ, you can't, Jesus didn't change his love for us when we got the trip because his love is unconditional. You preaching. You preaching. All day long. You preaching. Ephesians 5, 28. We're going to go a little deeper. It says, in this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. Mm. He who loves his wife loves himself. What does that mean to you, Carrington? Uh, this is what I mean by that. I'm <laughs> so glad you said you just started working out again. Because how I, how I take care of me is going to be a reflection of how I take care of my wife. Right. Mm -hmm. When we look at when we look at Matthew 22, right, expert in the law comes to Jesus. Hey, what's the most important commandment, most important law? Jesus response was to love God with all your heart, mind, soul, spirit and mind. Strength. Yeah. Just as important as this equal, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Exactly. Right. My wife is my neighbor because she's not me. Therefore, in order for me to love her properly, I got to love me properly. So how am I taking care of me? How am I prioritizing me yeah. and how am I valuing me? And here's the tricky part about it. We can be, I can put my wife before me all day long, but if the source of it is not a healed and healthy place, I'm wrong. Mm. If I'm doing it from a place of insecurity, if I'm doing it from a place of feeling lack, if I'm doing it from a place of because of the rejection and the neglect that I've gone through, I need to feel needed. So let me do, 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 do. You're not loving her mm. properly because it's conditional. When I tell you, boy, this, I'm getting emotional right now. <laughs> I don't know what you're saying right now that's making me get emotional. This is so freaking good. Thank you, Carrington. I don't know, the Holy Spirit just followed you up in here and you just, you cutting up. So here's the thing, you didn't hear my prayer. Anytime I have grateful honor at this opportunity, anytime I'm blessed with an opportunity to invest in people, whether it be one-on-one -on -one clients, group, or even like this, I always pray God minimize me to zero percent, maximize you to a hundred. Mm. Cause Carrington Brown is ignorant. <laughs> look, I'm you put born, toes in the wall. Look, born and raised in Oak Cliff, Texas. I'm Come a little, on, that's I'm my a little hood. different. Yeah. And so I don't have what people need, but God does, and the Holy Spirit does. Yeah. And once I give Him permission to take over me, I've realized it's just my responsibility to get in position, mm. and then give Him permission 
to take over and everything else to be taken care of. Mm. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Lord, Jesus. Oh, boy. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. All right. After all, no one in verse 29, after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they f feed and care for their body just as Christ does a church for we are members of his body. And you just touched on that. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ in the church. So when we talk about becoming one flesh. Mm. What does that look like? What does that mean to you, Ashley? Man. So I remember our, the premarital counseling that we received, they expressed the importance of that first year in cleaving to one mm. another. And they say leaving and cleaving. Yeah, mm. leaving and cleaving. <laughs> yeah. And to me, becoming one flesh is one staying on one accord, having that intentionality of pouring into our relationship so we can stay connected because you mentioned, you know, that term of growing apart, but we want to stay in that place of oneness. But I, I just feel like it's, it's such a beautiful place to be in as a couple where you can really say we're one. Matter of fact, when we pulled up today, cause we drove separate cars, he said, did you get something to eat? I said, no. He said, well, you didn't eat nothing. <laughs> I said, I ate two bananas and some trail mix. He said, I ate the same exact thing on the way here. So it's just like, even those, those little moments, I'm like, see, we won. We yeah. Really won. Yeah. And so what I would add to that is this, a piece of that is becoming one flesh sex. Being intimate. Right. Because my man T.D. Jake said sex was not created for a man and a woman. It wasn't created for a man and a man. It wasn't created for a woman and a woman. It was created for a husband and a wife. And so when we talk about that, marriage is that from that aspect is being physically intimate, becoming one, which is yeah. why sexual abstinence is, is, is so valuable. Yeah. But then along with that, could you just read that part of the verse just one it more said, time It said that, um, I'm going to go up a little bit. So yeah. after all, no one ever hated their own body, but they feed and care for their body just yeah. as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. Mm -hmm. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Cool, boom. So the sex piece, of haunted. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Look, I throw that out there. Yeah, put but that then out that there. cleaving piece is so important because to cleave means to be cemented together. Yeah, and the reason why it's so valuable, and it's I think it's funny that it tells the man to leave. Yeah, because we be the ones that be trying to hold on a lot of times, and you can't be cleaved to your mama mm -hmm. and be cleaved to your wife. It don't work like it just that. ain't gonna work. Like wifey number one. Yeah, and so like in my book, I tell men like. That conversation is your responsibility. Like mm. you need to initiate the conversation with your parents and with your family that, hey, and here's his boundaries. Yeah. Boundaries are in place because I'm the if I, be me choosing to, to get married to Ashley, my mom and them didn't change. <laughs> yeah. I change. That's true. I made a decision. <laughs> yeah. Right. So because I change and I made a decision, it's my responsibility to make sure that I implement the boundaries, standards, expectations necessary yeah. that align with that. Mm -hmm. It's not her responsibility to go talk to my family and say, hey, me and Karen are getting married. These are the boundaries. What? <laughs> it's my responsibility. Yeah. And That's it's real. necessary because when we talk about marriage reflecting Christ in the church, that's all about choosing one another in oneness. Mm -hmm. Marriage is about choosing one another in oneness. Right? Richer for poor, better or worse, sickness and all of that. Yeah. All of that. Oh Lord Jesus. Oh Lord. I'm so man, I'm I'm so full right now. Just, <laughs> Lord Jesus. Um I love when it says this is a profound mystery. Mm. A profound mystery. And that's why I say a lot of people don't really get marriage because People look at marriage as being such a negative thing sometimes yeah. and the way the culture is. Women are like, well, I don't need to get have a man to have a child. I can just go, you know, get ar artificial insemination and I can have my own kid. I can be. We start finding these uh, these, these yeah, loopholes and I call it hacks, life hacks yeah. and be like, I'm going to find this. I can get a kid this way. I can yeah. do this. And there's all this crazy stuff. And I'd be like, well, how's that working out for you? Mm -hmm. Because <laughs> if you really got it the right way and it was done in the order that God is nothing 
you can't beat that. Mm. There we go. You know, and the reason why you don't do it that way is because you say, well, that there's no guarantee that that will work either. So you go, well, I can go and fix it and make, you know, do whatever I want to do. Yeah. And it's like, so how's that working out for you? You know exactly. what I'm saying? Because now your kid growing up, oh, well, who's my daddy? Well, I don't, I don't know. You mm -hmm. just came from a test tube. That's exactly. just what it was. Mm -hmm. And it's like, that's not, that's not cool. Yeah. Uh, I want to add this. However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself and the wife must respect her husband. Mm -hmm. I love how that ends on 33 because the number one need for a man is respect right. and man looks at respect as love. Mm -hmm. And so the way you love a man is by respect. Mm -hmm. uh, men don't be like, I just want you to love me more. I want you to love me more they say i want you to respect me mm. <laughs> you know, very rarely That's we hear a man say just love me love they just don't woman say well you love me a man say respect me mm. uh so when you hear that ashley empowers then when when you hear that as um the number one need for a man of course that's no aha moment for you is respect how do you feel that you respecting your husband has cultivated the best version of himself. Cause what we looking at, uh, Carrington going in, like he's going in is because you're providing the space that, <laughs> that, that you provided him to flourish. Yeah. So, so, so how do you feel that your respect has, uh, fostered this type of environment in your marriage? That's such a great question. Honestly, respect to me goes back cause we were touching on, well, is this, did we touch on honor? It nah. kind of goes hand yeah, in hand. Yeah, with yeah, honor. honor. Yeah. But I feel like, one, I haven't always been perfect at being the most respectful wife, but what I just get so many revelations on how I can become a better one. Right. And for me, growing up with not a present male father figure in my life on a consistent basis, I notice that sometimes my lack of respect for men or certain types of men hinders my ability to receive from them so if i don't respect you i'm literally not i can't even hear you pick up i can't hear you yeah. and so with my husband i am intentional about if if there's anything that will hinder my respect because i know how respect will change my posture lack of respect yes i'm very i'll communicate hey you doing stuff like this and as my vision of a man or, you know, X, Y, and Z, I'm very good at communicating it, which helps me get a better understanding and increases my level of respect. And so again, I, it keeps going back to choosing wisely yes before you marry someone, you can see the fruit of the type of person they are. Carrington, I said we met on Instagram, searched him on Facebook. I remember pulling up a post on Facebook and I'm like, you know, doing a little snoop and I'm looking at the comments. You got I'm to. Yeah, I'm reading some of the to. comments and he's ministering to people in the comments. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, this is interesting. So Carrington, his words, his actions, it all Lined aligns, up. Yep. lines up. So it's very easy to respect him. But if someone is struggling with respecting someone, especially in the dating phase, it, you have to understand that's only, that lack of respect is just going to grow in your marriage. But I would say choose wisely and understanding that if there's things that would cause you to lose respect, that you communicate it quickly. quickly. So it's not something that's growing to infect the marriage over time in a negative mm -hmm. way. Go and jump in on this, character before we close out. Well, that communication piece is so big because, like, I've, you know, we talked about earlier when with the submission piece about, you know, I haven't been the perfect husband, made all the best decisions, which played a role in submission, you know? And we talk about respect is the same thing. And so when we look at choosing your spouse, as a woman, you need to be intentional about choosing a man who you can have that tough conversation with. Mm. If he's not doing what he needs to be doing in order to, to assist you in providing your respect and giving your respect to the extent that you want to, you might need to second guess that. But, you know, as you mm. touched on, respect is love. Yes. And I, and I just want to, I'm, I'm not even going to, I'm going to backpedal a little bit because <laughs> I want to touch on something you said a second ago about the mist. this is the mystery of marriage. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think it's so interesting that it says it because, one, it's a reminder and an indicator that, hey, all mysteries are hidden. But the real, the, real, the real truth that makes a mystery a mystery is not that it's hidden, but more so an individual's ability to understand and accept it. Mm. 
And so when we talk Come about. No, 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 hold on. You got to let, yeah, let it go. They're taking us too fast. Let it breathe. Yeah, let it breathe. Just let it just marinate a little bit. All right, continue. <laughs> so the, the real key and the real piece to a mystery of being a mystery is an individual's bil- ability to comprehend it, to understand it, and be open minded enough and mentally mm-hmm. mature enough to be able to say, okay, I'm wrong. Yes. Let me adjust my perspective and my beliefs to what I realize is true and right. Yeah. And now let me walk in this. No matter how uncomfortable it is for me, and no matter who's going to say something about it. Oh, there it is. Mm. You know what? You know, I can talk to y'all all day. Y'all just pouring into me. It's blessing me. I'm getting emotional. I don't know why I'm getting emotional. I'm going to talk to God about that. But why am I about <laughs> to cry while I'm listening to this episode? Um, well, I know what it is. It's because... I got married the first time. I was married two weeks shy of 10 years, but I never understood the gravity of what marriage was supposed to spring forth. Mm -hmm. I never understood what these vows meant. So it's so intentional that God would say, hey, as you're on this journey to discover, uncover, and recover love for yourself, I want you to take a couple of steps back. I want you to unpack what these marriage vows actually mean. And then most couples that I brought on here, they, you know, they'd be like, we said these vows, but we really didn't understand what they meant. They never looked at the, uh, where these marriage vows derive from, you know, they just like, okay, it was just great. And most people they wrote their own or whatnot mm-hmm. uh but they never understood that this is an oath that they're taking mm. and, and and an oath that's not to be taken lightly you know and it is supposed to be till death do us part but oftentimes because we have you know the way the laws are set up if i don't want to be with you anymore i can say all right i'm divorced you irreconcilable differences mm. it don't have to be no infidelity just i just don't like you yeah. i just don't like you irreconcilable differences mm-hmm. instead of saying if you don't like them like okay but you liked them before can we go back to what made you marry him in the first place let's yeah. unpack that let's heal that no nah, mm-hmm. I, ain't, I ain't got time for all that this is other I, I just i don't have time for this let's get a divorce mm-hmm. um and so that's why god has been so intentional to unpack these marriage vows and really get to the heart of what this truly means what god's word has to say about it and when i say y'all i just want to thank y'all because y'all ugh, I'm full right now. I'm going to go watch this episode about two, three times just to take notes myself because this was so powerful. So, um, listen, y'all have a very thriving YouTube channel. How can people find y'all? So, I'm at Ashley Empowers on everything. And I'm at The Carrington Brown. The Carrington Brown. I, I want y'all to do y'all little, y'all little intro y'all be doing on y'all videos. <laughs> do it. Do, do it. You want the... I mean, the 802 Which one? You game want the 802 time? game time? Yeah, yeah. So we, we started off with the 802 game time, so we'll do that. We'll, yeah. You want to start? You want me to start? Uh, uh, uh. <laughs> What's happening, beautiful people? And welcome back to my wife's channel, Ashley Empowers. I'm Ashley. And I'm Carrington. And you tuned in to another episode of 802 Game Time. <laughs> I mean, like when I watched, it, I was like, "That was just the perfect little YouTube couple." They just, they're just so YouTubeish. You know, like that, you know, it's like this YouTube thing that people have. It is so dope. So I love it. 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 Uh, listen, so um, YouTube channel, y'all have, y'all still just have the one channel. Or have you spun off and did your own channel? So I have a channel. It's Carrington Brown. And I'm talking about dating relationships and then a lot of mental health stuff as well. Good, like, That's good. my lane. I like. Well, I'm gonna put I'm gonna put links to both of y'all sites, and yours is Ashley Empowers. Mm-hmm. And so I'm gonna put the links on uh, in the description for both of the YouTube channel and social media handles. Great couple to follow. Great individuals to get to know. Um, man, I just thank y'all so much for bl- uh, blessing the the viewers and the listeners on the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Thank y'all so much. Y'all give it up for my new homies. Yeah, y'all my new homies. Y'all like y'all. Um, my new homies, Carrington and Ashley Brown. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you. you. Thank you. Y'all be blessed. Man, I hope you found value in this episode. Man, the Browns were absolutely phenomenal. I mean, gosh, I just thank God for providing these amazing guests that are pouring in into me. I just thank God for that. Hey, listen, you see this shirt that I got on? God is my publicist. Make sure that you purchase this shirt at DearFutureWifey.com. Y'all hear me refer to that slogan a lot, saying that God is my publicist. God is the one that grew this podcast to almost 60,000 subscribers in a little over a year because he's my publicist. And if you believe God is your publicist, then go ahead and represent it to the world. Here's my favorite part of the podcast. Um, where I speak to my future wifey. That's what's up. Dear future wifey, 
I will never abuse my position as head of our household. I will handle you with care and provide the love, stability, and covering only God can instruct me to furnish for our family. Ministry begins with you. The manifestation of my pre-work and healing is you. You are God's promise to me. I will love and cherish you. The Bible says, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. That's how I will cherish you. I will harbor you in my mind deeply and resolutely. This marriage vow series is God loving me through research. Is God loving us by helping me build a foundation on his principles before our I do's so we'll have reference to withstand the test of times. I love you. Your future hubby. Thank you for listening to the Dear Future Wifey podcast. Remember, be lit. Live intentionally and transparently. And don't stop loving. Make sure to subscribe to our Dear Future Wifey YouTube channel. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. We welcome your support. Simply share our podcast with your friends and family.